I want to encourage everyone this evening to open your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 1, and we're going to take a look at verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Here's what we read in that passage. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. We look at this passage and we can't help but think about the things that James has mentioned earlier. How he had talked about counting it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations or, or trials or difficulties or, or tests that we go through. We know that if we will endure and seek to draw closer and ever nearer to our Lord, that we will grow stronger that we will gain patience, that we will gain endurance, that we'll be made perfect and complete uh, in Christ. And here, he reminds us that those who overcome, those who endure and remain faithful to the Lord to the end, shall receive this crown of life. It's interesting to me to think about the different times that a crown is is spoken of in the New Testament by the New Testament writers. For instance, you might remember that the Apostle Paul talks about a crown. There in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 6 through 8, where he talks about the fact that uh, he had fought a good fight, he had finished his course, he had kept the faith. Henceforth, he knew that there was a crown of righteousness laid up for him, and not for him alone, but for all them that love the appearing of Christ. And so there he mentions a crown of, of righteousness. When you go to the book of First Peter, and you think about chapter 5, where Peter writes to his fellow elders, and he encourages them to shepherd the flock, to, to feed the flock. He tells them in verse 4, this and when the chief shepherd shall appear that that's Christ ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away so we've got a, a crown of life it's called a crown of righteousness and it, it's called a crown of, of glory and then again in Revelation 2 and verse 10 where Jesus addresses the church at Smyrna he encourages them to continue in their faithfulness. He lets them know that they are going to be put to the test. He says that the devil is going to try you. And he's going to cast some of you into prison for, for 10 days, he says, for a, a limited period of time. But, he tells them, be thou faithful unto death, even to the point of death is the idea, and ye shall receive that crown of life. There again, just like in James, it is referred to as a, a crown of life. So we've got a crown of righteousness, a crown of glory, and a, a crown of life. There's one other place that the writers talk about a crown, and it's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, where the apostle Paul is encouraging us to be faithful once more. And he uses an illustration of those who participate in athletic competitions. And on that occasion, he writes this, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And so here our crown is talked about being something that is incorruptible. It's an eternal crown, one that will last forever. You think about a passage like that that mentions the, the corruptible crown, an earthly crown, and tries to compare it to the crown that, that God shall give to the faithful. And I hope that, like me, it makes you think about the effort that is put forth by those who seek 
those temporary crowns. You know, this year, we have the Olympics coming up. They were supposed to be last year, but because of COVID, they got pushed back a year. I'm sure that was a setback for a lot of those athletes. They train and they plan and they want to be at peak performance at just the right time. And so they had to readjust their schedule and, and the things that they were doing. But you consider the amount of effort that is put forth by an Olympic athlete. I was looking today just out of curiosity to, to try and find how long they train. And what I found, of course, is that they train all different styles and, and different time periods, but most will work toward making the Olympics or, or trying to win that medal for somewhere like eight to 10 years. And they will work each day just about like we do at our regular work week, about 35 to 40, 45 hours a week trying to prepare themselves for something that you think about the 100 meter sprint that's over in less than 10 seconds. All that effort. Now the crown that we are striving for is offered to us as a promise by our God. God has promised this crown of life to all who love him. To love him means that we're going to walk in his ways. Remember Jesus saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. John writes in 1 John that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And so if we love the Lord, if we'll walk in his ways, we are promised this crown of life, and no one can take it from us. I mentioned that the Olympics were moved back one year. They're coming this summer if this world continues. But I imagine a lot of you remember back to 1980. That year, the United States boycotted the Olympics. They were in Moscow, the Soviet Union. And in late 1979, Moscow, or the Soviet Union, invaded Afghanistan. And as a protest, Jimmy Carter, our president at that time, decided that we should boycott. And the Olympic Committee of the United States agreed. 466 athletes were supposed to compete in that Olympic from the United States. Over 200 of them were never to get the chance. Some of them had competed in 76, and many of them competed in 84, but there was a whole host who had spent the majority of their life till that point training and preparing for that event, and it was taken away from them. I read about a man by the name of Craig Beardsley. He was a 200-meter butterfly swimmer fastest in the world. But because of the boycott, he wasn't able to compete in the Olympics. A week after, I guess 10 days after that event took place in the Olympics, he swam the event here in the States and he finished a second and a half faster than the person who had won the gold medal. Four years later, he tried to qualify and he missed the team by less than four-tenths of a second. And it was over. That crown that he had desired was never to be. How awful. But you know, even if you win a crown like that, how long is it going to last? It's temporary. They perish. But the one that we have waiting for us this crown of life, it's a crown of righteousness. It, it, it's a crown, we're told, of glory. It's the crown of life, and it is incorruptible. Let me ask you tonight, what kind of crown are you desirous of? And how much effort are we willing to put 
toward that. Remember, we are to strive to enter in that narrow way. If people can put forth such effort for temporary rewards, how much more so should we for the eternal? Do you have that crown of life promised by God waiting for you? If not, won't you make this the night that you start that journey, that you come to Christ in obedience, put him on in baptism for the remission of your sins, and begin that life of love for God and his way that will lead us one day to receiving that crown of life. My friend, if you're subject in any way to heaven's invitation, come now as together we stand and sing.